In this episode, we geek out about Marvel's Spider-Man game, Destiny 2, Veronica Mars, Creed 2, and Bumblebee, then freak out about Telltale, Fortnite, the Joker movie, and Movie Pass. All this and more on the Geek Generation. Hey now, welcome to the Geek Generation. I'm your host, Rob Logan, joined in the studio by Paulo. We're back! For Quick Take 2, you guys didn't hear the first one. We had an audio issue. We started over. <laughs> I could have ignored it and not mentioned it on the podcast, but <laughs> it's not fun if I uh, don't bring it up anyway. But we did take a little break from our episodes, and the reason for that is uh, excitedly for myself and hopefully for you guys too, Random Movie Club, our movie-centric podcast, is back, uh, which I am excited about because I enjoy doing it a lot. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of people that, wow, this felt more fluid the first time we recorded it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so a little behind the scenes talk. Uh, we did like three or four minutes and then we were hearing a clicking during the episode and uh, we stopped the episode just to check the audio. And it was like a headset issue. It's like <laughs> it, my giant head was stretching out the plastic. I don't. I don't thing. think it was your giant head. I think one. We don't use the headsets that much anymore. Uh-huh. So they are probably stiff. Honestly. So my giant head <laughs> was warping these stiff, already stiff headphones. Sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> but uh, I, I felt like if I didn't say it on the show, then I would have like felt awkward saying all the same things that I just said to you two minutes ago. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. Anyway, uh, like I was saying, Random Movie Club is back. Uh, It is a podcast that we started doing in 2015. We did like 14 episodes. The whole premise is that I bring on a co-host. They choose the movie. We both watch it independently of each other. And then we come together and have like a uh, half hour to 40 minute discussion just really talking about every aspect of the movie, spoiling the hell out of it, going over trivia. Uh, I love doing the show, and I'm super excited that it is back. And the reason that it is back is because listeners are financially supporting it. I know, right? People <laughs> take time making things, and it's helpful if you support them financially so they can keep making things. <laughs> what a concept. Oh, uh, Wow. <laughs> It's almost like the entire economy is based on that. It's almost like it's almost like. Um, but the the more that uh, someone is financially supported, the more that they can keep making things. So Random Movie Club is currently out every other week. Uh, it's the only way I could viably do it right now with the current support that we have. But we do have another financial goal in place that if we reach that amount per month, then uh, the release frequency of the show will increase to once every week. Instead of every other week, so you get four episodes a month instead of two episodes a month. And this one's going to keep going still uh, as long as I don't keep forgetting about it. Yeah. <laughs> when you're juggling a lot of plates, sometimes things. Yeah. Rob's uh, got a lot going on. Yeah, there's you know? stuff happening. Yeah. Um, but if you would like to help out with that, you can go to thegeekgeneration.com slash support. That is our Patreon page. And even giving as little, I think the the minimal amount is set to $2 a month right now. Uh-huh. That much is super helpful. Uh, if you go up to the next tier, that's where most of the benefits start kicking in at the mm-hmm. $5 mark. We have special roles in our Discord channel. Uh, we do movie events for our patrons only. We're going to have bonus content. So uh, occasionally when I'm doing a random movie club episode afterwards, I have a few plans with it. Uh, I think some of them will be like our flick chart episodes that we used to do. Oh, yeah. Where we literally are just like pitting movies against each <laughs> other. And, and then you find out that you like a completely different movie than you thought you liked. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and I, I enjoyed doing those. I think those would be kind of fun little dicking around episodes to mm-hmm. put up as bonus. And I, I want it's got to be stuff that doesn't require like too, too much preparation. But another one would be like literally just pulling up someone's IMDb page of like a specific actor or director mm-hmm. and just kind of talking about everything on there. And oh, just yeah. going through for like an hour. Because some people, some of those directors could be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, those those are like the two kind of things that I have in mind for bonus content. Mm-hmm. So I'll put the, when we record the first one, I'll put that out on the Random Movie Club uh, audio feed mm-hmm. so people can hear an example of what bonus content would sound like. And then uh, if you want to get that bonus stuff, that will be behind the pay gate of Patreon. 
So there is a feed which you can actually like just take from Patreon and stick it in your podcast player. Oh, okay. So you don't even have to go like seek it out. You mm-hmm. only have to do that once and then all the bonus stuff will be delivered to you in that way. Excellent. Yeah. So there'll be like a bonus episode a month uh, right now. And then if we if we get to new places, then who knows what yeah. could happen. I mean, it's it's a fun concept, too, just in terms of revisiting old movies, because this kind of gives you a reason to mm-hmm. watch these older movies, you know, and especially yeah. if it just so happens to be one that you enjoy, but you haven't watched in a while. Like, it's a good way. It's a good reminder and also a good excuse to, like, go back and watch that movie. Totally. It's the whole reason I started the podcast. Yeah. Is because we all have those lists where, like, I'll watch that movie one day. I'll yeah. put it on my watch list. and. Mm-hmm. Then I just wouldn't. I was always watching the new stuff yeah. and never going back. But this gives me a reason. Granted, mm-hmm. I will rewatch a lot of movies that I also like rewatching. I also have had to watch the movies that I don't care for too much, but mm-hmm. I hadn't seen them. <laughs> so I still uh, it was an excuse to watch them, though. So I'm still being exposed to stuff that I hadn't seen, which I appreciate either way. Right. Yeah. Well, let me just I just want to say one thing to the listeners. Yeah. Listen up, you scumbags. I know that you pay $5 a month to get access to those IG models private Snapchat. (laughs) This isn't that much more. And you're getting premium content. Sure, you're not getting nudes. But you're getting premium content produced by Rob Logan. And we'll talk to Mike Volpe about producing nudes. So, (laughs) (laughs) No promises. Volpe dick pics. (laughs) Uh, but yeah, obviously, um, if you're someone who just likes listening and you don't want to support, it's going to keep coming to you. There's nothing I can do about it. But if you would like to help us out a little bit, uh, if you've been a listener at any point, I mean, we've been doing this for eight years. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to help out, God, this is so much begging at the front of a bun. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, no, but, I mean, it's not a novel concept. You invest in something and it gets better. Yeah. Like, I, and especially like at a level like this, this is this isn't like a giant corporation where your money just goes into a black hole and you never see the you never <laughs> read the benefits of it. It's literally going to one person who does all the work. So, <laughs> like, like if you could throw him some cash, things will get much better. And imagine if things get much better. It's gotten away from me begging for money. Now it's Paul begging for me to get money. Listen, <laughs> listen, I'm an advocate. That's what I do. <laughs> Paul's like, someday I'm going to quit my job. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to become a professional beggar. I was going to say podcaster. But podcaster. <laughs> same thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, let's get into the show. We're going to start off as usual with our geek outs. Yay. Paul, what are you geeking out over? So my uh, perennial abusive ex-girlfriend is back. <laughs> Destiny 2. <laughs> We're back in the game, baby. I've started playing Destiny 2. Oh, yeah? I have on PC. On PC. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on Xbox One. Um, So Forsaken released uh, three weeks ago, I think. Yeah. Um, And it's the I think it's the biggest content release since the release of Destiny 2. And honestly, like I say abusive Mm ex-girlfriend because of the nature of the game, like the grindiness and all of that. Mm -hmm. But this is actually the best version of Destiny that is released. Really? It's like the the first game. Um, and the first game was only better by virtue of it just being the original and being like the sort of like the trendsetter. But Destiny 2 Forsaken is big in almost every way. Um, it created a much uh, bigger universe based off of the lore from the previous games. Mm-hmm. The story mode is actually entertaining and it, it keeps you... Uh, interested in the story okay um and by virtue of that i mean like it it builds interest in the lore surrounding the game and it's not so it's not just a first person like space magic shooter okay it's uh something that you actually tend to care about especially if you've been playing since the the original game uh the end game content and the uh post story mission content is far and away the quality is way better than before Mm. um they've introduced uh the tangled shore and the dreaming city these are both areas that you get to after you reach the level cap and finish the story content okay and the the tangled shore is not huge i mean it's in terms of uh like the content of it and also just the the perceived size of it but the uh dreaming city is just it's another like level of 
just scale. Hmm. Um, so the Dreaming City, for anybody that's played Destiny, they know that the Dreaming City is sort of the um, the spiritual home of the Awoken, which is one of the race uh, types that you uh, can play in the game. And it their queen uh, played a role in uh, a previous expansion for, mm-hmm. I think, De- for, yeah, for Destiny 1. And so you are tasked with exploring this area and sort of uh, undertaking the missions that are given to you. Okay. And the, the cool thing about the Dreaming City is that there is a – one, there's a rotating cycle, which they call like a rotating cycle of curses. The curse increases – Every week on a three-week cycle, and as things get worse, uh, more content is released. Hmm. And so by virtue of creating this artificial cycle within the game, the developers have uh, given us given themselves a way to release or keep the game interesting by releasing more content. Okay. Um, and it's not, it's not like you're paying for it every time something new releases. You've already paid for it when you bought Forsaken. And so... There are still things that are to be released. Uh, more, most recently, there was a new dungeon that was unlocked, um, and a couple of exotic weapons that you have to do quests for, which are grindy as hell. But when you actually get the weapons, they're very satisfying. Um, and like there are cryptic tweets from Bungie developers that, that seem to suggest that more is coming. And so, They've done a much better job with this game in terms of scale, anticipation, and interest, I think. Mm. Um, and so it's not really just a grindy shooter anymore. There's more to it. Um, one of the cool things from like the first week was after they released the raid, um, the first sort of six man fire team to beat the raid unlocked more content for the general public. Oh, wow. And so it gives incentive for higher level or higher skilled players to sort of participate in the community. And so I think they've done a much better job with Forsaken. Um, I'm, I play it every chance I get. Um, I've literally fallen asleep playing the game just because, not because it's boring, (laughs) but because I'm so, I like, I'm so vested in getting like better gear or advancing to a certain stage of, of this like certain activity. Like, and I just, my, my real life just takes up so much time and energy, but I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to soldier through. <laughs> and like, I've literally just been hunched over on the couch with like the controller in my hands. Oh my God. And the only thing that wakes me up is just like the loud noises of your, like of your overshield breaking <laughs> in the headphones. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> like I wake up I'm back and I start like start, try to start playing again. Uh, but yeah, destiny Two, uh, forsaken much better. Oh, uh, one thing that, I really enjoy about the new game is the new game mode called Gambit. Mm. It is a mix of PVE uh, player versus environment and PVP PVP, player versus player um, play modes. Uh, The goal is to um, bank a certain resource called moats, which you get by killing enemies into a central bank. And once you bank enough moats, you summon a primeval, which is a thing that you have to kill. Okay. And um, there are certain things that affect your ability to bank moats. Uh, The opposing team can lock down your bank and you have to unlock it by undertaking a certain task. It's usually just killing something. Mm. Um, And there's like a portal that allows you to jump to the opposing team's map and stop them from collecting moats. Or when their primeval is up, every one of their deaths heals their primeval. And so you actually have to play the game. It's it's <laughs> yeah. it's way more confusing when you explain it. But I mean, I'm still on the first story mode from the original game, from, the base game. Oh, from Destiny I haven't too. finished the original story yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is I mean, this is like a much like the next level for you, but yeah, Gambit is hard to explain, but it's also super fun. Cool. Uh, even with just a completely random group of people so it's like a four-man team i've only ever played gambit with like some of my friends or co-workers like infrequently to say the mm-hmm. least but i've played mostly with like random four-man groups and it's still fun sweet yeah so if you were in destiny at some point in your life i would suggest that you go back and you want that time sink back in your life <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I understand, like, it is a grind and it is a sort of, like, 
Yeah, but people wouldn't do it if they didn't like it. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's it is there is a sort of psychological satisfaction that you get from playing this type of game. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially if you're into like MMOs or any type of game where you like grind for a certain reward. Like that's that's basically the apple in this. I mean, you know, the cherry. Or, sure. Apple, carrot, carrot on a stick. Jesus Look, Christ. Food, fruits and vegetables. <laughs> You're in the right ballpark. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'm geeking out over. Uh, the second one is the Legal Eagle YouTube channel. So this guy is a he's a he's a lawyer mm-hmm. uh, who started a YouTube channel where he basically does what every lawyer does when they watch a legal show or any movie that has legal content in it he picks it apart yeah (laughs) he picks it apart and just completely ruins it by injecting the reality of the legal profession into it um i i find it interesting uh some other colleagues of mine have found it interesting too just because he does take up some like you know very well-known pop culture like legal icons Mm -hmm. and sort of like take them apart and point out the things that make it interesting for other people but ruin it for people like myself and other lawyers Uh, because you know it's basically like the reason why we hate law and order or you know like anything like that if you've ever wondered about how a lawyer thinks i think this his channel is excellent for that it gives you some insight into how a legal mind works and so if you just happen to have somebody in your life who you were close to that uh, you interact with and you wonder why is he or she like this, mm-hmm. th- I think this channel is actually an excellent way of oh, interesting. introducing you to that sort of mindset because it explains a lot. <laughs> I um, When I saw this listed in the show notes as something you're going to talk about. My brain immediately went to um, wanting a channel where it's like Sam the Eagle from the Muppets just <laughs> explaining law to me. <laughs> I mean, the guy doesn't look like Sam the Eagle, but um, it, I, I think it is an excellent sort of if you've ever been curious about it, even like, yeah, it's an excellent introduction into it. Um, his episode about suits, the the show suits. Oh, yeah. USA, the one where the guy like doesn't take the bar exam or doesn't pass the bar exam and like somehow becomes a lawyer in a, like a top, like a top five, like big law firm in New York City. And every just the immediate sort of like visceral reaction of everybody who's ever been <laughs> in law school is like, no, fuck that. That's fucking bullshit. <laughs> he he basically tears it apart and is just like, no, everything about this show is like completely against the like the rules, the yeah, ethics yeah. of the legal. Pro- like, so. Uh, definitely check it out if you've ever, you know, even thought about why somebody in your life thinks the way that they do. Cool. The third thing that I'm geeking out over that I added at the last minute because when we were putting the show notes together, this actually released. Yeah, yeah. Was the cr- new trailer for Creed 2. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I felt both manlier and emasculated at the same time watching it. Yeah, because these these are these are gods among men. Mm hmm. So, like, I mean, the guy, Victor, the guy that plays Drago's son, I forget his name. It's like uh, Florian something. I, I don't know. I forget his name. Spiner Ripiter. Yeah. He's just a monster. Yeah. Like, there's a there's a line in the trailer where he's like, like, he was raised in hate or something. And I'm like, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> like, you don't you don't get a body or like an <laughs> attitude like that by not being raised in hate. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, it looks amazing. And like. There's that one point in the trailer where they use like the da 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 for the from yeah. the Rocky theme, and you're just like all the feelings just come boiling to the surface, and you're like, yes. I had a lot of fear with Creed two when they were first talking about it, and mm-hmm. like Stallone was going to write and direct, and mm-hmm. fortunately he decided not to direct. But no fear, no fear, no more. Yeah, <laughs> I'm and, in, and like it's just so yeah, I. I I was like, I was blown away because I mean, this is the second trailer too. Mm-hmm. Usually, the second trailer is by that time you're like, uh, why am I looking at more footage of the right. movie? This is the one that really sold it, though. Yeah, like the first trailer was kind of like, eh. This this one was just like, oh my god, they're really gonna these guys are gonna kill each other. Yeah, <laughs> but like also, it was it, like I think part of the reason I really enjoyed it was that um uh, so like in anime, like a lot of like the 
like the titular characters or like the heroes of the show, mm-hmm. they always have like this moment of realization where they say, it's not about me. It's about my team or it's about my mm-hmm. family or it's about us. You know, like there's this realization where the hero becomes a hero for everyone. And I think that kind of happens in the Creed 2 trailer too. Yeah, Like it's like, I'm not just a boxer. I'm not just boxing for myself. Now I have this family to, to take care of and to care for me. And I think that was like one thing that was really appealing to me, just being like a father and yeah, like yeah. being having that sort of experience. So uh, it comes out in on Thanksgiving, and I'm going to be in Philadelphia for Thanksgiving, so I'm definitely oh. going to go and watch this movie at the theater Thanksgiving night because oh my god! Well, I'm going to be driving to uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go see Creed Two. Oh man, so good, so good. It looks awesome. Yeah, I'm so yeah, down. I am scared of the guy that plays uh, Drago's <laughs> son. Oh my god! There's that one part in the trailer. I, I can't stop because I'm so I'm freaking out so hard over it. But um, there's that one part in the trailer where he's doing like a weighted pull up. Yeah. And the sound that oh, they yeah, edit yeah, yeah. into it is just like this weird sort of like guttural. Like it sounds like a demon is doing pull ups. Like it, it is truly terrifying yeah. like, to see that happen. And you're just like, oh, my God, this guy is like it just reminded me of that line from the original. movie: If he dies, he dies. You know, it's just like, oh, my God. Yeah, like, yeah. If, he, if he says that during the movie, I'm going to shit my pants. <laughs> That's incredible. And the last thing I'm geeking out over is hot sauce. I know it's weird. Um, but so I'm. <laughs> Cause we never geek out over food related things. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people who are just internet savvy are aware of the show Hot Ones mm-hmm. on uh, First We Feast. Sure. Um, and you know, that show was kind of brought to the forefront a lot of, uh, brands of sauces that, you know, if, unless you were sort of, a pepperhead or you know into hot sauce you wouldn't wait is there a name for people i've heard pepperhead really yeah and so (laughs) like there were a lot of sauces that like i saw in the show that like i mean i would have never even ventured out to you know find and i'm not sure if maybe my palate is dying (laughs) or like i just like i'm just getting older i don't know but like spice has appealed a little more to me like in the last like i don't say year or so and so i've like been trying to like go out there and find stuff that is tasty but also spicy you know what i mean like i don't want to just like blow out my palate i just I, i but i do want something that has some heat to it and that makes certain foods a little more interesting mm-hmm um, and so my current like hot sauce geek out, I guess you could say, is the secret aardvark sauce. Um, secret aardvark makes a bunch of different sauces, but I'm talking about the tomato based one. So this okay. is the habanero sauce. It's great. I mean, it's the right amount of like smoky. The heat can get a little intense in the beginning. Like, if you know what I mean, like it's I just stay away from spicy stuff entirely. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> like, I mean, I guess I any, guess any hot sauce is like, ah, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm a big baby. So, like, it's, I guess the best analogy would be it's like a hot bath. Okay. So, like, you get into it and initially it is shockingly hot, but then your, your, you know, your mouth sort of your palate acclimates to it. Okay. And so now, then it becomes just a sort of smoky, tomato y sauce that goes well with a lot of things. So, I would say if you were, I mean, at this point, I feel like if you know about, uh, hot ones, and if you are into hot sauces, you've probably already tried Secret Aardvark. This is not news to you. But if you are somebody who is sort of dipping their toe into the hot sauce realm, so which to speak, doesn't sound advisable if you want to actually eat it afterwards. Yeah, I wouldn't dip your toe into the bottle, or even dip your toe into it because I feel like some of these hot sauces are hot probably enough. painful. Yeah, where, where you have like a cut on your toe, it's not gonna. Yeah, <laughs> it's not gonna feel too good. It's not gonna feel great at all. But I mean, you know, if you are interested or curious about it, I think Secret Aardvark is a good way to go. So Secret Aardvark habanero tomato based hot sauce, definitely good. Try it out. Sweet. That's it for me. All right. The first thing I am geeking out over is uh, the return of a show that I enjoy quite a bit that mm-hmm. has not been on the air for a while. But they did do like a successful Kickstarter mm-hmm. to get a movie a few years ago. Uh, that is Veronica Mars. Yeah, I heard about this. It is coming back. The announcement was officially there were rumors for a while. Uh, but then Kristen Bell actually went on like Instagram and Twitter and all the social medias and confirmed it for all of us marshmallows because that is the name that is given to Veronica Mars fans. Uh, creative. Uh, so the complete series, as it currently exists, is coming to Hulu, including the movie that they ended up releasing. 
Plus, they are going to create eight new episodes that will arrive in 2019 for a new season. Uh, apparently, the plan was to do more at one point, but they are limited by Kristen Bell's schedule working on The Good Place. Oh, that's right. She's on The Good Place. Right. So that, yeah. this is going to be like in the off time for The Good Place. They're going to do Veronica Mars, uh, which is fantastic. The premise of the new season is as follows. Spring Breakers are getting murdered in Neptune, thereby decimating the seaside town's lifeblood tourist industry. After Mars Investigations is hired by the parents of one of the victims to find their son's killer, Veronica is drawn into an epic eight-episode mystery that pits the Enclave's wealthy elites who would rather put an end to the month-long, I do not know this word, Bacchanalia? Yeah, that's right. What is that? It's... it. <sighs> I just know of it as sort of like a a reference to party, like just unbridled party. Okay. All right. Uh, the month-long bacchanalia against a working class that relies on the cash influx that comes with being the West Coast's answer to Daytona Beach. So, I mean, they could have said anything for the premise. That's fine. I'm in. Uh, <laughs> Veronica Mars <laughs> opens Burger Shack. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in. down. I'm down. Uh, Marshmallow Burger Shack. Yes. Yeah. So... I'm super pumped. I can't believe like this show had that like only had three seasons way back in the day yeah. is now three seasons. Probably. I'm such a fan. I can't even remember. How many seasons <laughs> that. Uh, not only like had the Kickstarter movie, but then that apparently that I, I mean, you got to credit that with kind of the revival of interest in the mm -hmm. franchise at all. Because yeah. if that movie doesn't happen, then how does this even become a thought in anybody's mind? Right. Plus, she's probably at arguably the height of her popularity right now. Yeah, I, I would say that. I would say so. Between like, coming off of Frozen and The Good Place is doing remarkably well. And mm -hmm. like the last, I would say, six to seven years have been really great for her career, yeah. I think. Yeah. She's definitely been in some medium, in some form of another, you know, for the last eight years. And so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm excited for more. Yeah. And I think, I think, I feel like part of that, like that success is just timing. Like the, the idea that, you know, her show experienced a renaissance as her fan base got older mm -hmm. and got to a point where their disposable income could go towards funding that movie. And then in turn, you know, just continuing to grow. In interest and it, like I guess part of it is also that you know Kristen Bell is willing to keep going yeah a lot of people with a show and under their belt that is you know however old Veronica Mars is almost 15 years ago yeah yeah like you know there's no interest in that or they, they just want to explore something new but you know the, she, the fact that she's willing to continue to build on that sort of franchise is a testament to I guess the quality of it too it was a good show. Yeah. And so many people are coming back to it that they've already announced, too. And I'm sure we'll see more. And there's something there's something nice about seeing a cast that's just that much into it. And still, mm -hmm. after all these years, is still so much into it. It's not like they're trying to hold on to this thing because they have nothing else going on either. It's like yeah. this is this is a thing that they're just passionate about. And they're like, we love these characters and we want to keep seeing stories with these characters. I'm like, yeah, that's I love that. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, I'm I I I don't know if it would get me to sign up for Hulu, mm. but I would definitely watch it if I was on Hulu. Yeah. Which might happen soon cuz cable is ridiculous. <laughs> and every every single streaming service is coming out with better and better original programming yeah. now. So the dub the allure of cable is definitely getting less and less. Like if like if I don't have if I didn't have kids and they didn't have certain programming on demand, like sure. I probably wouldn't get it, you sure. know, because it's just for them. Yeah. Uh, another one is a Kickstarter, which uh, mm -hmm. we just kind of talked about a little bit there. Uh, a show called Undergrads came out in 2001. It only lasted for 13 episodes on MTV. I was a big fan of it because it was a show about a bunch of college kids during the time that I was in college. college yeah. So uh, I gravitated towards it right away. I was super bummed that it only lasted for the 13 episodes that it did. And it mm -hmm. did. I mean, it, I mean, it's a comedy animated show. So how big of a cliffhanger could they possibly have? Yeah. But it wasn't resolved necessarily after the 13 episodes because they were expecting to make more. Mm -hmm. So they have a Kickstarter running right now to get undergrads the movie made and just kind of revisit those characters and wrap up the whole thing mm -hmm. uh the creator of the show does the voices for most of 
the main cast. Mm -hmm. So it's a very like Beavis and Butthead situation where like they don't have to go get all these different people and bring them back to yeah. do this. He, he's got most of it covered on his own. But uh, I I'm, I haven't checked it. Uh, I know it was at like 40 something days left in the campaign when I last saw it and they were already like 50 percent there. So I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. I'm just excited that it hopefully will. Yeah. Um, I can't say that I was a fan. I think this kind of, the original show flew under my radar initially. And so, I mean, I'd be interested to see it if it did experience a general release. Mm. Um, but yeah, the show is available actually on, I have a DVD with the entire oh. season that you can uh, bring home with you if you'd like to check it out. Cool. So. All right, yeah. It'll be something else that I can fall asleep to because I can't stay awake for anything anymore. <laughs> nice. It's not it's not a, a a judgment of the quality of the show. It's literally like I I get fifteen minutes into any show. Yeah, yeah. Like it could be like the best show ever and I would just <laughs> <laughs> just out. Yeah. Just out. Uh my next one is also a trailer that saw a recent release. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most unexpected things mm -hmm. that I expected to be geeking out <laughs> over. Yeah. It's the friggin' Bumblebee trailer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so when the first trailers for Bumblebee came out, I was like, this is what they should have kind of done from the beginning mm -hmm. to where they're emphasizing like one Transformer at a time, allowing us to kind of learn about that character, but also really focusing on the relationship between Transformers and humans. Mm -hmm. Humans in the Transformers movies have always kind of felt like props. Yeah. They don't really get any depth or anything like they're that. They're kind of there to remind you that they're on earth. Right. Yeah. But they're supposed to be our window into even believing that this stuff is going on. Yeah. So when the Bumblebee trailers first came out, I was like, this is the Transformers movie I wanted. Why, why am I getting like this weird hopefulness to a franchise that has, hurt me so badly it is weird i mean the fact that you know you watch this trailer and you're like i want to watch this movie yeah it's like confusing. It, it comes out as a question <laughs> yeah. because you're like so i've been taught over the last decade or so that transformers movies are synonymous with just like an orgy of cgi and explosions that really makes no sense yeah and suddenly I'm confronted with this movie, this, this trailer for a Transformers movie where it's a, it's a small part heartfelt. Mm -hmm. You know, the CGI is there, but I mean, obviously, because Transformers are not real, mm -hmm. but it's not over the top. And then you see a lot of like the classic designs oh, for the Transformers. That was like the, the cherry on top of everything. Like I was, I was hopeful. Uh -huh. And then I saw like the gen one transformer designs yeah. in this like inspired by gen one designs and they showed me sound wave yeah and the tapes yeah. were coming out yeah and i was like i'm back in because michael bay in <laughs> his original iteration yeah. of sound wave like completely kicked the fan base in the balls by making sound sound wave one not a tape recorder mm -hmm. and a weird communication satellite mm -hmm. thing and then making like ravage be this sort of weird big cat panther looking thing that was just like i don't get it like that's no that's not what it's supposed to be yeah like it's easy to sort of make like for michael bay to have made uh like megatron as this weird alien jet because he actually has been like sure before. he's been any number of things it, yeah nothing <laughs> makes as little sense as when his original turning into the gun thing yeah there's no physics in yeah that there's whatsoever. no physics that like no. there's no way that you can compress that much matter no not happening but Soundwave was one thing and one thing only he was mm -hmm. a boom box mm -hmm. and ravage was one thing and one thing only he was a cassette tape that turned into a doberman mm -hmm. like it was that those were two sort of things that you could not like stray from because they were so hard to like interpret into another medium yeah like what are you gonna do turn Soundwave into an ipod that's fucking retarded <laughs> like i mean i'm sorry to use that word but it is like it is stupid <laughs> like part of the appeal of Soundwave was the fact that other transformers popped out of him yeah like this guy like it, it's sort of the yeah like you he had options yeah he was the know? transformers den mother <laughs> <laughs> rubbish yeah laser beam. yeah and the voice too rumble. like i love that if and like, rumble is in this movie i'm gonna lose it yeah 
<laughs> Rumble was amazing. Rumble was the best. <laughs> like I remember in some of the cartoons, like Rumble would come out and then like he would create a flood by just pounding yeah. the bottom of a river. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Which didn't make any sense, but and he was a little brat. Too. Yeah. He's like, Rumble's gonna he just starts like pounding the ground. <laughs> so good. But yeah, like it's so weird that you've been trained to hate something for so long mm-hmm. that suddenly this thing comes around and you're like, huh? Yeah. And cautious. now it's, it's this, yeah, the cautious optimism. Yeah. It's like, don't do it to me again. Like, don't tear my heart out again because you're really doing a good job yeah. of dressing it up. I don't like I, the bar has been set so low for like a story in a Transformers movie that like, I feel like they can probably, they could probably just soar above that bar and make it uh, have these in the movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing they're doing too is they're setting it in the eighties. They're setting it during a time when we were kids watching the original transformers yeah. and they're bringing us back there and giving us the transformers from that time. I want this so badly to be mm-hmm. like a secret reboot of the transformers universe. Uh huh. And everything else just didn't happen. Like, what if you're watching the movie and then you you hear the song from the original Transformers movie? Uh, you got the touch. Uh, <sighs> like, what if? Here's the other thing. Have you heard the theories? No. Okay. So, based on this, we know John Cena is in the movie. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, they in this trailer, they show a, like a weird scar on the right side of his face. Mm-hmm. And there are now theories out there. His character is called Agent Burns. They're wondering if Agent Burns becomes the first G.I. Joe. Mm, Because there was talk about a a crossover. A Hasbro universe. Yeah. Yeah. And Mm. G.I. Joe has a scar on the right side of his face. It's not in the same exact place. But like, why put that scar there? Uh Uh-huh. So now people are like, is that character going to become, even though it looks like he's the antagonist in this movie with the military, yeah. as they've stupidly been a presence in like every Transformers mm-hmm. movie so far. But is this a backdoor way to introduce G.I. Joe into this universe? Yeah, that would be. See, now I'm like <laughs> pulling back. <laughs> it's too much. Because G.I. Joe is another franchise that kind of has a stink on it. It you does. Know? It does. Like, I mean, they weren't the greatest movies, you know, like, but like, what if? Yeah. You know? I never like love loved G.I. Joe anyway. Mm-hmm. But if they want to backdoor a G.I. Joe crossover into yeah. this, sure. Why not? Was there ever a G.I. Joe and Transformers crossover like in the, like, in the past? I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Not that I'm aware of. You know what would be supremely funny is if they made like a meta joke about not being able to G- see John Cena in the movie. <laughs> like if he was just somehow un like they couldn't see him and for some reason he was just plainly there. Right. You know? And uh, I mean I that's just me. Like that's just the internet meme me just being like, <laughs> please make a joke about John Cena. Just do it just because. Uh but yeah, very, very excited. Or uh, again though, cautiously Cautious optimism. optimism. Uh but this is the first Transformers movie that Michael Bay is not directing. Mm-hmm. He is one of the producers just because I think he has to be. But uh, uh Travis like a- Knight is directing this one, who uh his only other directing credit to this point is Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh. Which was a wonderful movie. Yeah. So I'll take it. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we'll see, I guess. Sure. Uh, my next geek out is a TV show that you may or may not have seen. It's one strike against it is that it's only six episodes long. And mm. I really, really wanted more of it. And I still do. And that is Justin Willman's Magic for Humans. Mm-hmm. Have you watched this at all? I watched the first episode. It is delightful. Yeah. I I I liked it a lot just because I like Justin Woman, but mm-hmm. also I like this type of magic. Yeah. Where you just like you overwhelm the expectations of somebody who's not expecting magic. Yeah. And then it's just like Yeah, it's I I liked it a lot the first episode. It's very it. smartly done in multiple aspects. For one, I don't think it's easy to show magic on television. Yeah, because unless you're doing like stage magic Mm -hmm. and really just like pretending we're at the magic show, Mm -hmm. people right away go, oh, let's tell it. Look at all the stuff we can do in TV. Mm -hmm. Like who's to believe if this he's even doing this? Like there's there's it's it's weird because someone's authentically doing these things Mm -hmm. with no 
visual effects outside of the editing yeah. or like in, within the editing process or something. And we're still like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I buy it. Mm-hmm. But having that real world kind of aspect and people's reactions to it is what sells it for the audience at home. So I think not only are they showing the magic very well, but I love the kind of every episode. I know you've only watched the first, but yeah. each episode has a theme to it. Uh-huh. So there is not a narrative, but there's a thematic tie yeah. that goes through each episode. And I just like that. It's not just random magic. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's there's there's a little more thought put into yeah, it. Yeah, there's than an that. organization to it. Your yeah. brain tends to favor that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think it's very well done. I understand why it's only six episodes mm-hmm. because this stuff is not easy to put together. Yeah. And I respect the hell out of it. Uh, but I do want more immediately. <laughs> yeah. David Blaine did something similar, you know, I think a couple years ago where he filmed a series of videos with like a bunch of like celebrity fans, mm-hmm. like Will Smith and his family. And then like, like Kanye West and his family and like all these, like, you know, like pop culture icons, people who, you know, and the thing that I realized by watching that show is that when they put magic on TV, mm-hmm. especially in that sort of that setting, that very intimate setting and where it's not like an audience and a magician, but like a magician with his friends is that, your Im- the the implication is that you trust what the magician is doing is genuine mm-hmm. and that you are judging the reaction of the people in the room that is your gauge for how amazing this thing sure. is because otherwise like you're just watching a guy do a weird card trick and your brain immediately goes into skeptic mode yes. like you know this is something that's filmed like you can just edit the shit out of this and it will look completely like you know, the most amazing magic in the world, Mm -hmm. but the people in the room are the sort of like the gauge whereby like that is how, you know, this is real. Mm. And Justin woman kind of the, like Justin woman's show is similar. I would think sure, where these people are not expecting what is happening. Uh, like in the first episode, I think it was the, the, the trick with the cell phone. Uh, the one. Oh yeah. 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 Do I want to spoil it? Uh, I mean, they have a YouTube clip of it oh, okay. too. So, so it's so it's out there. So, like, he takes a cell phone and then just ties it to a balloon, mm-hmm. a helium filled balloon, and and not just any cell phone, a cell phone from a person he meets yeah. randomly in the park, who is completely just the the one thing that detracts from that that whole bit is just like the fact that people are willing to give up their phones that easily. Yeah, well, that that is the one thing that kind of took me out of it for a minute. Well, but, I imagine he disclosed a little bit, like I'm a magician. Yeah, like this is this is not don't worry. Yeah, this is this has a happy ending. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, like this sort of sleight of hand, like that type of thing. Like I love seeing the reaction of the people, not necessarily the trick, but the the reaction of the people, because that is the thing that tells me like, oh, my God, like Mm -hmm. there is some real element of mystery to this. Yeah. You know, like I bet if I experienced it, it would blow my mind even more. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I really like the show. I like Justin Woman just from like his sort of resume of stuff that he's done. Um, he did a Cupcake show now. He was the host of Cupcake Wars. Cupcake Wars, yeah. yeah. So like he was definitely on TV a lot. I like his sort of energy. Yeah, he so. used to do a uh, a magic YouTube show for Nerdist. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. There's um, you'll see like those interstitials mm-hmm. that happen. Like uh, they do magic for Susans in the first. Oh episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that's funny. They do another one that's called like trick questions, uh-huh. where he'll show him a trick and ask him a question immediately, uh-huh. but the question never has anything to do with the trick. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> so people are just caught off guard by the question. Yeah, it's funny. But a lot of those interstitials you end up are in Nerd Melt. Oh, okay. Which is now uh, or Meltdown Comics, which is no longer no longer there, there. Yeah. but. So he's he's like part of that whole kind of crew. Yeah. Of like comedians and nerds that I like in yeah. LA. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this weird sort of like like you feel real close to them because you've consumed all of their content. Yeah. But at the same time, I've never met them before. So it's like <laughs> like if I saw them in real life, I'd be like, hey, oh, I know, oh, yeah, this is weird. I should introduce myself. I've met some of them. So I'm going to pretend like I'm a part of the group. <laughs> oh, OK. Oh, excuse me. No, no, no. Well, I met Pete Holmes. I have uh-huh. met Camille Nanjiani on a yeah, few yeah. different occasions. I met Chris Hardwick, Jenna Ray, Matt Myra, like. I know all of them. Yeah. All is what I'm saying. <laughs> Listen, we're <laughs> we're almost on a first name basis. Almost. Uh, anyway, more more magic for humans, please. Netflix, make it happen. Definitely. My last geek out is uh, I left it for the end, even though I originally <laughs> had it listed first because it's the biggest one. Uh-huh. 
Marvel's Spider-Man video game for PlayStation 4. Mm. Made by Insomniac Games. Uh, I actually, so I finished it this morning. Finished the 100% completion on it. I've been playing it for the past few weeks. And it is an absolute masterpiece. (laughs) <laughs> it is i know i'm i'm gonna kill paul here because he's like please don't make me buy a playstation 4 ah! uh it is one of the best games i've ever played really yeah explain <laughs> okay show your work so they did so much right here um i'll get it out of the way saying that of course there are little bugs here and there it's a freaking video game there's no such thing as a perfect video game but the amount of bugs were so minuscule in the grand scheme of what there could have been mm-hmm. that that alone is a feat. Yeah. The story, uh, and I will say this is kind of like the Arkham of Spider-Man. Okay. To where they didn't, they were very smart to not base it on one one existing property. They kind of picked and chose things. From different parts of the Spider Verse. Okay. They also didn't give us an origin story. This mm. is eight years into Peter Parker being Spider Man. Yeah, he's old Spider Man, right? So he's now. a little more right. seasoned. He has had a relationship with Mary Jane already. Oh, okay. That uh, is over, but is it? Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of things going on. Uh, Aunt May is still around, obviously. Um, we're seeing a. As one of the main antagonists, a villain, and this is not, I won't give any spoilers, don't worry, because uh, this is all in the press stuff, like in the promo materials, uh, the, the, one of the main antagonists of the game is Mr. Negative, mm-hmm. a character that you have not really seen in the more mass media offerings from Spider-Man. Yeah. So we're getting to learn about a new character a little bit, which is interesting. Also a very sympathetic character. Uh, I still, I love uh, the, the current existing mcu spider-man but prior to that my favorite spider-man movie was spider-man 2 because Mm -hmm. i love dr octopus because he is an incredibly sympathetic villain villain and i think that is 50 times more interesting than any like one note common bad guy villain. uh and we see the evolution uh because it starts out dr octavius is your mentor and you work for him as a scientist in a lab so there is this relationship between Peter and Otto that is like really touching. And there's mm-hmm. like a nice mentor mentee relationship going on there. Okay. Meanwhile, you also have like Miles Morales on the side. Who? Who Peter is like kind of a mentor for. Interesting. And it's not, it's not as Spider Man. He's a mentor to Miles as Peter. Oh. So there's, there's a lot of that interplay between characters that we're all familiar with uh they're not really like they're not twisting things too much but Mm. they're doing things very smartly to create their own universe Mm -hmm. which is nice and and the story alone is phenomenal really it's really really good i had maybe the most emotional reaction to this game the story in this game than i have any other game Mm. Because it, it just, oh God, it's, I obviously I can't, I don't, I don't want to say too much about it. I, I won't spoil anything. I'm just saying like, there's, there's some really heavy stuff that happens in the game. They just get you so much into these characters. I never cared about Peter in the way that I did in this game. Mm-hmm. Like I was always like, give me Spider-Man, give me Spider-Man. I always cared about Peter Parker mm-hmm. and you always care about him as a person. But I was like, I want to see more Spider-Man. Yeah. I was like genuinely excited to play as Peter in the parts that I played as Peter in this game. Now, does that have anything to do with the fact that this is an older Spider-Man? Maybe. That you can relate more to him as opposed to like teenage Spider-Man? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I mean, back in the day, sure, I definitely related to Spider-Man more because he was like that high school student yeah. dealing with the same things you're going through. So at that age, you certainly latch on to Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. But maybe that there is something to that. He's struggling in life a little bit. Yeah. He's having a hard time paying his bills, finding a job, mm-hmm. all that stuff. He's dealing with girls in still a way that I am where like he's mm-hmm. just confused by them. Uh, and <laughs> there's he's just juggling the things. It's the Spider-Man we've always loved. He's juggling all the problems of his life while juggling the problems of being Spider-Man. Excellent. And it's it's what you want. And then on top of that, on top of that story. You get this game that operates just wonderfully. It's uh-huh. it's like 
and people keep comparing it to uh, Spider-Man 2, the game or whatever, because that was the one that did it really, really well with the open world mechanics yeah. and swinging around and making it feel good. And this one, like I could just swing around for hours and have fun with it. Yeah. Uh, the side missions can get repetitive here and there, uh-huh. but it's not as daunting as it was in that game and not as repetitive as it was in this game. I feel like so, that happens a lot. It can. It can. There's enough varied to where I was never like annoyed with them. Mm-hmm. The only ones that kind of bugged me were the Taskmaster challenges. Oh, okay. So Taskmaster shows up at one point. Uh-huh. He's not really story relevant. He's just like, I have challenges for you. Like, okay. It's a reason to fit these challenges in. And it's basically like their version of the Arkham AR challenges. Oh, okay. So you have like challenges where you're chasing a drone and that's your swinging through the city challenges. Uh-huh. You have combat challenges. You have stealth challenges. Mm-hmm. So it's those type. Um, the drone challenges in particular are a freaking headache. <laughs> but I got gold level on everything. Nice. Because uh, I'm a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though it became frustrating in certain parts. But those were the only parts that I was like generally frustrated with anything in the game. Uh-huh. You could argue that the game itself is a little bit too easy, especially the boss fights. I didn't really find challenging at all, mm-hmm. but I wasn't there to be like challenged. I'm not playing Mega Man. I don't want to like have to learn this thing over and over until I finally get a pattern and beat yeah. it. I'm so into the story. I want it to keep going. Mm hmm. And the game was just challenging enough to where I felt like I was an active participant, but I could keep going with the story and it was still an open world and I could still do things in different orders. So because when a game does this and they offer me so much on the side and because I'm a completionist, it feels weird to me to finish a story and then go back and be like, I'm going to do all the challenges now. Oh, really? So I do it all before I finish the story. The last mission is the last thing I did. Oh, okay. Because when that ends, the game's done for me. The game's over. It's like, if that story were to end earlier, the story's Uh over. Why am I still playing? I'm a completionist in a different way, like the opposite way. Like, I, like the story in most games that I played where there's a story mission and then there's sort of end game content or peripheral content Mm -hmm. like i treat the story as like my my dinner sure and then everything else is just kind of like snacks or sure sure so like i i generally just try to get through that i don't know if it's because i I, i'm seeking context through the story for everything else or if just everything else to me just seems kind of like the stuff that i need to get done because i'm neurotic in that way you know as a completionist like, I don't know how it, like how it works exactly, but that's just what I've done in the past. Yeah. The um the desire for me to do all the stuff isn't just because I want to get it all done before the story. I also want <laughs> because I'm playing a superhero game. I also want to be OP as early as possible. Mm. So if I do like all the side missions at the beginning and I get all the experience from that, mm-hmm. like I'm way leveled up behind, like oh. further than what I should be yeah. by the time I get to story. The only thing that detracts or makes it harder for me doing it that way is because sometimes the, they put all the like tutorial pieces mm-hmm. inside of the story. Oh, okay. So like I went and beat the crap out of all these enemies that were brand new to me mm-hmm. on side missions. And then they taught me how to beat those enemies later on in the story. But I think that part there's to some degree, there's a lot of level of satisfaction there because like, if, especially if you have to figure it out mm-hmm. yourself, you know, instead of going through the tutorial. So I kind of see that as a positive. Yeah. Oh, no, I got to buy PS4. <laughs> oh. It is. It is an absolutely wonderful game. Of all the games that have come out on PS4, even my abusive ex girlfriend Destiny, like I never even like I never like the experience on PS4 for Destiny was supposed to supposedly better because yeah. there are more exclusive like gated exclusives for the PS4 and you know that the experience was generally just better from my understanding. And I never caved. Like, I was just like, I don't need two, two game consoles. Mm-hmm. Like, my life is like full enough as it is. And for some reason, like the hype behind Spider-Man was just like it just reignited this itch where I'm like, uh, do I need to have two? <laughs> do I need two Blu-ray players? Of course I do. The biggest problem is that the hype is justified. 
Oh, that's the biggest problem. The worst part for me, like <laughs> seeing all like the media and stuff around it is just like seeing the stories where they're like comic origins of all the costumes. Mm. And, and I, I'm just like, oh, cosplay dream. Like, I just want to do it, you know? And I will tell you this. This is not something like, oh, you need to get the game. But something they did brilliantly mm-hmm. that other games need to adopt immediately mm-hmm. is that. There's all these different costumes in the game, which is great. There's like a ton of different costumes, yet no black suit, by the way. Oh, no symbiote suit. I think there's a reason for it, but no symbiote suit in this one. Reason being no See, symbiotes, no symbiotes. Oh, OK, no symbiotes in the game. OK, so like there's no venom. There's no carnage. There's they're just like not present. They've never nodded to it at all. There's a nod. Oh, okay. there's a nod, but it's not a major part of the game whatsoever. I see. So I can understand why they're not in there, even though I just really, really wanted it in there. Yeah. But the thing that they did really well is when you unlock a suit, they also give you a suit power Mm. that you unlock with it. In most games, they latch that power onto that suit and you have to wear that suit to get that power. So sometimes you're wearing something you don't want to wear like just to get a one thing. Yeah. 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 And you're like, well, I want to wear the cool looking suit, but I want this power. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. And you can't. Uh-huh. In this game, you can. Oh. The suits are separate from the suit power. So you unlock the suit power when you unlock that suit. Uh-huh. But if you want to use that power with a different suit, go right ahead. Mm. So like I could have the iron spider arms with just like my regular Spider-Man costume if I wanted to, because they're not tied to the iron spider suits. Mm, damn it. <laughs> I think every game needs to adopt that immediately. No, 100%. Because I think developers definitely underrate how important it is for us to look cool while we're doing stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Like people, there's such a huge emphasis on like function over like the formality of stuff. Mm-hmm. And by formality, I mean like the, you know, the, the cosplay element of these games yeah. where you, you have a character that looks a certain way. You know, if you have armor that looks a certain way and you, you like the way that looks, but suddenly you get something that's better for you stats mm-hmm. wise or, you know, brings up your level to a certain like to a, to a point where you can't sacrifice the power that you're getting from right. that. You know, it you're forced to make this choice where like I have to look shitty, but I can progress in this game right. and maybe look better later. And I think that's smart. Like you get your power set is sort of linked to the character itself and not to the clothes. Mm-hmm. And so like you can have a you can look good and feel good doing it. <laughs> it, it feels weird to say that because it sounds like a men's warehouse commercial. It does. <laughs> but but it's exactly what it is. You'll like the way you look. Yeah. You know? Like you'll like the way you look and you can continue to play the game. Yeah. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, and speaking of the way you look. It has uh, a photo mode, which I love photo modes. Oh, so okay. I mean, I'm a photographer, so yeah. obviously I spent a lot of time <laughs> taking because <laughs> because there's there's like they, they just uh, patched the game a little bit, too. And they added like exposure adjustments and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you can do like your depth of field and you can do you can open the aperture. So you get a nice bokeh effect and uh-huh. you can play with different filters and wow. you can rotate the camera. around. It's really well done. And I've taken a lot of pictures <laughs> and I will and post can, them in the show notes. <laughs> can you see and you can save the pictures? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. So, incredible. I mean, I wish PlayStation had a better way to just like send them over. Like yeah. I could tweet them out and save them that way. But I have to stick a USB drive in and like bring them over that way. But but still cool. Still super cool. So the game takes place in like New York City. Right? Yeah. Not like a replacement for New York City, but the actual it's New, New York, York City. City. OK, so I saw this on Twitter the other day. I follow, I'm, I'm a fan of Diaz, Diaz and Mero. Shout out to the brand. The two comedians that had a show on Vice for a long time. Okay. Uh, they now have a show or have a show coming up on Showtime. Uh, but I like their, their brand of comedy. They're very like local New York and they kind of have built a following around that. But Diaz recently tweeted out a picture from the Spider Man game that looks like it has them like literally like just doppelgangers of them in the game really where spider-man has to interact with wow now my question is do they have sort of references to new york city in the game that are more than just like the empire state building or the brooklyn bridge like i mean they have those in there mm -hmm. but they also have like avengers tower okay they also have the sanctum sanctorum oh really they have uh, you can go to uh, an office or like a little 
corner uh, on two streets and see the Murdoch and uh, like the the law offices of like they have Marvel references in there all over the place. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many Easter eggs. Ah, I love games like that. I love that attention um, to detail. There, there's so one of the things I haven't finished yet, and mm. I'm surprised it wasn't part of the hundred percent completion. And I'm still gonna like swing around and do it. Is they have secret photos because you have a camera, you're Spider Man. Mm, that sounds questionable. And <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, there, one of the objectives in the game is to take pictures of different locations. Like, take a picture of the Empire State Building, okay. take a picture of Brooklyn, Lo- and they're marked all these things that they want you to take photos of. And that's like the collection. Uh, well, no, there's backpacks too, so you can collect those. Yeah, as well. yeah, yeah, I was yeah. reading about that. Those, but like all that stuff's marked on the map. It's not like struggle to find this stuff. I gotta look this up on. It's Reddit. marked on the map. Okay, so that's not a problem. Uh, the secret photos, however, are not marked. Mm. So these are the like the Easter egg things. Oh, so the first one I stumbled upon, and I just took a picture of it, and even figured out that there were secret photos I could take. Mm-hmm. Was I found a statue of Lockjaw? Okay. From the Inhumans. Uh-huh. The big bulldog yeah, 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 yeah. was in the street and I was like, that's freaking that's freaking lockjaw. That's weird. And I pulled out the camera and I took a picture of it just for the hell of it. And it uh-huh. was like one out of fifty secret photos taken. And I was like, What? <laughs> like it's not a thing the game tells you. Yeah. So now I have like 30 something of them. And then one of the not a suit power, but you can get power ups for your suit. You mm-hmm. have like three slots. Okay. Where you can put like different abilities in. One of them, the last one you earn when you get to max level is to show uh, the secret photo locations on the mini map as you get near them. Oh. So they're not on the big map, like mm-hmm. on your pause menu, but there's still like some sort of a locator to help you find them. Like your radar, it pops up on your radar if you're yep. nearby. Nice. I like it when, when they put in Easter eggs like that where they don't publish a lot of material around it yeah and you're just forced to kind of find out for yourself that's part of the reason like destiny 2 was good because they kind of left you wondering how much is left yeah you know excellent yeah highly highly recommend mm. you get a ps4 and- <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm, I'm so really, sorry oh, what is that oh it's nothing it's another cable box yeah. uh, <laughs> definitely not a ps4 absolutely not uh, before we get to our freakouts, just a quick note that we're actually giving something away. Ooh. Yeah. We are currently running a giveaway for a copy of Marvel Studios Ant Man and the Wasp on Blu ray. Speaking of things, Marvel, the contest is open to US residents only, uh, because that's where it's, they're willing to ship it to. I don't have this DVD in hand that I'm giving out. Oh, okay. It's, it's an, so we, we just finished doing another giveaway. I'm just derailing my whole giveaway promo right now. We just did a giveaway mm-hmm. where we gave away five pairs of tickets right. to see the Transformers, the movie from 1986, mm-hmm. uh, and as their Fathom events one night only showing. Yeah. So that this works the same way where. I will get the winner's information and fire it off to that company and they will mail you the thing there. Oh, I see. Um, so uh, Marvel Studios Ant-Man the Wasp on Blu-ray. The contest is open to U.S. residents only and all entries must be in by October 26th. You can get all the details on how to enter over at thegeekgeneration.com slash giveaway. We're using a system called Gleam to do the giveaway. Uh-huh. Uh, so a lot of the ways to enter are things like retweeting a certain tweet or following us on Twitter, Uh or following us on Twitch. Mm -hmm. Looking at the Patreon page, you don't even have to pledge. If you just like click on it and look at the page, that's an entry. So it's little things like that. You're helping get the name of the Geek Generation out there while possibly winning a prize for yourself in the process. And it's not a bad prize. It's not a bad prize. It's a good movie. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, it's that time, Paul. Oh, negative Nancy time. (laughs) It's time for our freakouts. Oh, freakout! What do you have? So first freak out uh, was about the news of Telltale Studios shutting down. Yeah, out of nowhere. Yeah, kind of definitely shocking. I mean, they kind of they've defined the genre of like the point and click sort of story mode Mm -hmm. video game. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if any of their games were a flop. I feel like they've all were good. (laughs) <laughs> with that being said I've, I've never played one i've played a couple that i didn't love but it wasn't like the mainstream like it wasn't the the franchise ip stuff okay that i played that i didn't like it was like it was i think they were in studio like puzzle agent i didn't love i didn't love hector and the badge of carnage or whatever okay those are those are ones i had no idea but about, like so. batman and guardians and yeah. all that stuff was awesome 
Okay. Yeah. So it definitely was shocking to hear that they shut down. I mean, like my current job gives me more of an insight into like business and how it works. And mm-hmm. so I, part of me is shocked, but another part of me is not surprised that this kind of thing happens because, sure. you know, they, you know, at any point in time, they could just run out of money. Like it's not a very stable business model. It's not like you're like a something you would traditionally identify with being very stable. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they're also in a massive lawsuit with their former CEO. Oh, uh, OK. That I did not know. But yeah, just sort of reading stories about uh, the studio shutting down, uh, the things that were sort of concerning to me were like the toxic work environment, uh, just the sort of emphasis on the product over the employee, Mm -hmm. like treating their employees, you know, relatively poorly. I wouldn't say as poorly as some of these articles are suggesting because they best, they are definitely not taking into account the reality of sort of like a software developing like turn and burn atmosphere yeah it's a grind yeah it's not i mean it is definitely unfortunate but it is also sort of the reality of that industry and it's not telltale's fault i mean it's just sort of like an industry-wide standard where things have to change on a larger scale in order for that to be solved so i mean i don't necessarily blame them for it but it's also not healthy It's just one of those things where like it's just as a general bit of like life advice or knowledge, you know, just for anybody that's working for any company that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not self-employed or, you know, if you're not working for a business that you believe in or is a cause that you have attached yourself to, if this is really just your job, Mm -hmm. you know, never put your health, your well-being, your family, like anything like that above or never put the company and the work that you do above those things. Mm -hmm. Because like, there are a lot of tweets that I read of like while looking through or, you know, reading about this uh, story where like every, like a lot of people are just like, they have the same sort of sentiment. It's like, yeah, don't put the company above yourself because the job posting for your position will be in the newspaper sooner than your obituary or something like that. Where, you know, like the, the general premise is that, you know, this you are being treated as a commodity with a minute that you are no longer of use to the company. It's not like they're going to remain loyal to you. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of like the sort of, that's just how the world of business and just like employer employee relationships is in this country. It's not like a, like it's not a terrible thing. It's mm-hmm. not a great thing either, but it is important to keep that in mind. So, you know, just if you are in a business or if you work in a position where, you know, you are forced to, to, you know, sacrifice time, energy, health, definitely take this into consideration sure. that this is not the end all be all. Uh, if you are suffering, then, you know, definitely take a step back and consider that. All the more reason to also be self-employed and build your own thing. The geek generation.com slash support plug. <laughs> Excellent plug in there. Also, um, we should note too, just along with the Telltale thing, that they're currently releasing the final season of the Walking Dead game, right? Which people had paid for the entire season for, mm-hmm. and now are like, "Well, what what's happening yeah. with that?" And there's a lot of rumors going on. At first, the the second episode just dropped, mm-hmm. kind of around the same time that the announcement was made. There's two more expected, or were expected. Mm-hmm. Telltale at first came out and said that they have a bunch of partners that they are working with that want to see it released Mm -hmm. that will kind of financially make it happen. I mean, they scaled back from 250 to like 25 employees, like massive, massive. And that's intense for 25 employees to carry that load. I mean, they, they. I sure hope that they do have these partners, partnerships. Um, But even another update, uh, Telltale has requested a temporary pause of sales. Of the Walking Dead final season, the studio reportedly confirmed to Polygon the season pass sales have been halted as it works out how to finish the final two episodes. Yeah. So that's a it's on the gamer side like it sucks, obviously, way more Mm -hmm. for the people that were working at Telltale. But on the gamer side, too, as a consumer, if that is a story you've been invested for these last I don't know how many years, but four seasons and you you were expecting an end, Mm -hmm. they said this is the final season, then I mean, I feel there's some obviously money could prevent it, but yeah, something should conclude. Stories need to end, Paul. No, definitely. I agree. Uh, 
like I'm of two minds of this. Like I, the creative side of me or the consumer side of me, you know, those, both of those sides of me. Wow. Both sides. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> the creative, Go with it. the sort of creative consumer side of me. Yeah. Sees this and says, yes, I definitely, you know, if I have already paid for something, mm-hmm. I deserve to have that end of the bargain held up and that this story be wrapped up in a way that is satisfactory to me just because, you know, without the consumer, you would have never had this in the first place. Mm-hmm. Please just uphold your end of the bargain. At the same time, this is a software developer. The The industry is not very stable. Things can change very quickly. Mm-hmm. And that's just the nature of the business. The fact, you, you know, bigger studios have an easier time because they either have, you know, the proper investment, like they have venture capitalists backing them. So it's not difficult for them to keep funding something, even though it is not turning a profit. Yeah. Because they see the value in completing an IP or completing a project rather than leaving it hanging. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you just leave it hanging, that is money you have definitely already lost. Yeah. In investment but at the same time it's just you know i i also kind of sympathize to a degree because sure. it's like really you're gonna like half ass like the rest of whatever you're trying to put out by using 25 employees and this sort of vague unknown partnership the quality seems it almost will certainly suffer yeah yeah so yeah what are you gonna do it's a tough spot to it is be for in. sure Second thing I'm freaking out about, am I too old for Fortnite? We both are. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is, I mean, um, this is an old man warning alert. But, um, you know, like, I'm not a young buck anymore. Um, and especially when it comes to, like, the sort of video game media that I consume. I like to think that, you know, that that I am still young in that regard I'm still a hip cool mm-hmm. little individual <laughs> it's like that uh steve semi meme it's like hey there are children or <laughs> yeah, hey yeah. there are kids <laughs> um yeah like so i tried playing fort like i kind of resisted fortnite yeah just because it was so explosively popular that i immediately was skeptical mm-hmm. of its quality um, just watching videos and like seeing the sort of uh, media attention around it. Like it just, to me, it just seemed like hype. Like it did not seem like a quality game. I kept hearing about it and people kept telling me like, oh, you know, it's not bad. It's definitely like a, it's not a full meal. It's a sort of like candy snack of a video game. If you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It's there to serve a certain purpose. Um, and so if you're looking for like, you know, the next great like Morrowind or like, you know, anything like that, like you're not going to get it with this game, but it is, it does serve a purpose. Yeah. And so after just, you know, being inundated with news about it every day, I mean, I, my news feed, YouTube, everything like that, it definitely leans towards video games. And so inevitably I'm going to see some of this stuff. And so I get more and more curious. And so. I eventually just caved. Um, I've tried it on a friend's account Mm -hmm. and I just, I, I don't know. Do I not have the fast twitch muscles anymore to execute a game like this? Is it that you don't feel like you're doing well or is it you're just playing and you're like, this is stupid? (laughs) Kind of both. Okay. So like the building aspect of the game. So I didn't play the game mode where all you do is build. The single player experience or the co-op experience that it originally yeah. was. I did play a little bit in that version. And what did you think of that? It was fun. Really? It was I, fun. I just. It, it was it was tower defense is what it was. Okay. It was a co-op third person tower defense game. So you build your base together. Mm-hmm. There were swarms of enemies that came in. And not only did you have like your traps and things set up. But then you could also run around and kill people, too. Oh, okay. So it was tower defense from a different perspective. And then it just became Battle Royal. Maybe it's because I only played the Battle Royal then. Because I tried that. And, like, I feel like with these games, there's a very steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're not on the train from the beginning, then you have already fallen behind. Mm -hmm. And so you're not, or I was not as, like, even with my experience in games, like, I was not at a skill level where I could sort of even compete Mm. like everything about it. None of it made sense. My mental pliability was not like, I was not flexible enough mentally to just be like, to accept certain things like, 
why is a shotgun really this good at range? Like, this doesn't make any right, sense. Right. Everything about games in the past has told me like a shotgun is like a close range weapon. So right. why is it good now? Like, it didn't make any sense. Um, I saw a guy ride a rocket and then it killed me. And that kind of just, I was like, what the, what is this? But he was on the rocket. How yeah. is he alive? Like, this is dumb. Yeah. Like, why am I, and it's just, I got very like, like, get off my lawn about this sort of game. <laughs> like, I was just, I just got fed up and I just stopped playing and I just went back to Destiny and I was just like, I'll just stay with this because this is what I know and goddamn these kids. <laughs> and so, like, I just felt really, like, it made me feel really old. I mean, I've played Fortnite a handful of times. I didn't play the single player that much. Like, I went through the tutorial, mm -hmm. so I didn't spend that much time with it. I played the Battle Royal maybe, mm -hmm. like, twice and never by myself. So that's the okay. other. I would never play this game by myself. Yeah. It, there's no appeal to it for just me. Um, and even when I do play with others, it's less about playing the game and more about just doing something while chatting. I see. Like, if, <laughs> like yeah. it's because it, it's a no-brained activity. I Fortnite. See is yeah. and it's what it's become and kind of known by the game community as is it's there's two things you do in the game you build up and you shoot down mm -hmm. that's it yeah the whole game has become building towers as fast as possible and shooting down on people because you get a better perspective of their head to give them a headshot mm -hmm. that's the game and okay. that's not fun or exciting to me yeah so like i've gone in and i hang out with friends playing and we just dick around and that's fine. Yeah. But like, I'm never going to take it seriously. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it's because I don't have as much free time. And so that's not as appealing to me. But also one thing that was sort of like an interesting sort of like a contextual exercise, I guess you could call it, is that while Fortnite has Battle Royale and it's kind of popularized that genre, mm -hmm. there's also the new Call of Duty Black, Op Black Ops 4 yeah, yeah. where they have their own Battle Royale mm -hmm. mode. Like that to me was not as terrible sounding. There's a ton of battle royale. It's it's the new genre yeah. that's like super popular. And Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is like the one that really popularized it mm -hmm. before Fortnite yeah. stole their formula and basically ran with it. Yeah. And PUBG I like I tried that as well. Mm -hmm. And that one was even more frustrating just because I kept it's dying. It's super buggy too. Like from like random shit. Not random shit, yeah. but, you know, like I would get sniped from across the map and I'd just be super frustrated. The main reason I don't like Battle Royale games in general is because the <laughs> the fact that you can just die so fast mm -hmm. and be like, oh, now I have to leave this game and go into another game. Yeah. Like there's a level of frustration there. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, I don't I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, it's it's too ADD. Like there's not enough building up to like a like a objective yeah it just feels too short yeah i guess yeah but anyway yeah i just i just freaked out because for the first time in my life i looked at a video game and i was like nope too old for this shit like i like like danny glover like yeah I'm, yeah i'm getting too old for this shit and i just put the controller down speaking of getting too old speaking of getting too old my third freak out my son started kindergarten and it feels like i'm going back to school and it sucks i hate it oh my god it feels like you're going back to school yes why it's like, okay, so <laughs> so my son recently started kindergarten, and so a lot of the first month has been like, so drop off and pick up is always this ordeal where, you know, you have, you it inevitably are forced into social interactions mm -hmm. with the other parents. One, because it's the beginning of the school year, and, you know, like you see the value in like knowing your child's like classmates, parents, yeah. you know, uh, but also because like, there is a period of time where you're forced to kind of stand around and wait. And so especially with drop off, like it feels weird because I'm back to being awkward. Paul, I grew out of awkward. Paul, I see like in the, like after like fifth or sixth grade. Yeah. Like I came out of my shell and from never look back, but then for some reason, uh, you know, because this is my son, like this is my oldest son. So it's his, my first interaction with this school, sort of atmosphere mm -hmm. since I was in school. And also there are other parents there who have already had children go through the system. Okay. And so they are already friends. You're the they, new kid in the class. I'm the new kid in the class. Exactly. And I hate it. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> it feels weird. There's a reason we create our own little microcosms and stay in them. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, I 
to a degree, I want to grow as a person. And so and I see the value in socializing with people because that will inevitably benefit my child mm -hmm. because he will have a better connection with his friends. He, you know, like there will be like, inevitably there will be play dates and like anything like that that will benefit him. I see value in. And so I try my best to sort of build on that. With that being said, I hate some of the moms in his class. It sucks. Yeah. They're all friends and I don't like it. They're all in their little click and they're like, oh, little Timmy's doing great. He's in third grade and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hi, guys. Yeah. And they're just, it just, uh, I don't know, something about it. Like, the real reason, Paul, is that the majority of people suck. And, <laughs> and hey, and you know, like, it just, I, some of these people, like, I'm sure they're the nicest people. But at the same time, so, you know, we moved to a different, uh, we moved to a different town to take advantage of the school system. And, I don't want to say the name of the school, the, the town that we moved to, just because I don't want anybody to pick up on this and be like, oh, you're that guy that talks back about it, <laughs> you know. But so we moved to a different town to take advantage of the school system. And this town is sort of, I don't know if uppity is the right word, but, you know, mm. it is affluent. Sure. And so there is a certain amount of compare and contrast that goes on. Mm -hmm. There is a certain level of judgment that you can sort of sense. Sure. It is the beginning of the school year, so that is less intense than I assume that it will be later on. But it's just, I don't like it. <laughs> like it just feels bad. Yeah, I know what you mean. It feels real bad. Yep. And, you know, I, I have to keep reminding myself that it's for my son and that he is ultimately the one that should reap the benefits of this. Sure. And if I have to incur any sort of like negative attitudes or anything like that, then it's just part of the deal. I just mm -hmm. have to deal with it and move on, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, sort of a parent corner there. Weird parent corner feels. I'm sure there's some, some people out there that feel the same way. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Right in if you do. <laughs> Podcast at thegeekgeneration.com. Feel yeah. free to Sh send your emails. Share your stories. Share your parent woes. And we might read them on air. We might. Uh, my first freak out are uh, some recent show cancellations and renewals that actually hurt the story. Renewals. Yeah. So we've seen this in the past. Like if did you watch Scrubs at all? Yes. Did you watch the ninth season of Scrubs? No. Like Scrubs is one of those shows that is just the reruns were on okay. like, all the time. And so inevitably I just watched. Okay. It. So Scrubs, this is not one of the shows, but just kind of as a more broad example of what I'm going to talk about. Scrubs is a show that went for eight seasons and uh, did a wonderful mm -hmm. series finale that we thought was a series finale. Yeah. Then they got picked up for a ninth season. They changed the entire formula of the show. Everyone just wants to pretend the ninth season doesn't exist. OK, so that uh, it's more of the show, kind of, but it hurts the overall story. OK, whereas you could just go, boom, I'm going to cut it here and that's mm -hmm. fine. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of is in the same boat OK, where they did something that could be a series finale. Mm -hmm. And they did. They said that they did it just in case. OK. And they did get picked up for like six more episodes or something like silly. That feels not even worth doing. But the two most recent are shows that I recently just finished watching because I'm always just catching up way behind. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is Scorpion, mm -hmm. okay. which uh, I'd been watching for four seasons. Was fortunate enough to interview some of the cast at San Diego one year. Uh, I enjoy the show. It's not like this amazing think piece. Like It's just like a fun it's a procedural. procedural. Yeah. yeah, like here's the problem. The geniuses are going to MacGyver their way out of it. Mm -hmm. And hey, we did it again. Yeah, and maths, it's fun. Maths and computers solved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they had uh, a series finale for the end of season four. And as most season finales do, they ended with a big cliffhanger. This probably won the biggest. I'm sure you don't care if I say what it is. Yeah. The Scorpion team kind of broke up based on the fact that Walter had told a little white lie. Him and Paige have been in a relationship. He told a white lie that he kept to himself. The real truth. It was nothing major, but it became bigger. It was just one of those like stupid little things that blew up like it snowballed and then it. it divided the entire team mm -hmm. so now the last scene we see of them is like three people on the team out getting contracts and now their competition are the four other people on the oh, team okay because they all like don't like each other now i see and we will not see 
how that plays out because oh. the show's canceled. Yeah, like I watched, you know, I started watching Scorpion 2 and I think I fell off at a certain point. I don't exactly remember when. I the last thing I can remember is that like Paige's uh boyfriend that was in like the marines sure. that became yep. part of the todd like, or whatever his name was yeah like he left and then walter Tom, and Paige sort know. of like came got back together mm-hmm. and then yeah like i i vaguely remember the last sort of set of episodes that i had watched but i kind of fell off just because like it got repetitive it is repetitive yeah and i felt that at times too yeah. So it was never like, uh, I got to watch. That's why I'm just catching up now. It was and never I, an, I got to watch Scorpion, but I just kind of did. Yeah, yeah. And I don't hate repetitive stuff. Right. In fact, I like it a lot for the end of the day because it helps me turn my brain off, mm-hmm. you know, and it's helpful in that way. But it was somehow the value of that was somehow outweighed by the sort of the droning on of every episode. Like I just knew that you know, eventually it was just going to be like, Walter does this or, you know, the, and there were no major stakes. Yeah. And like, there were kind of one or two overarching villains that existed in this universe, but Mm -hmm. they were kind of inconsequential at the end because they were just like, no, Walter's smarter than all of them. And it's just like, Oh God. Like, so like there were no stakes, there were no sort of like overarching storylines. It was just week after week of like the Scorpion team figuring things out. So like, I mean, the fact that they're canceled to me is kind of like, all right. I mean, I guess, but right. Like I'm not uh, like, I'm fine that the show's not coming back. I'm just bummed that it's leaving a dangling thread. I hate the dangling threads. Yeah, like it created something that you may have shown interest in. If I watched it had four continued. years of a show. Yeah. So you're invested in it. At yeah. least from a time perspective. There yeah. should be like a contract with the audience that if, if a show <laughs> goes for two seasons, if uh-huh. there's a cliffhanger, they're like contractually obligated to give one more episode just to wrap it up. Oh, God. From like a legal perspective, that's a nightmare. I'm sure You're it is. A contract with like millions of people. I know. I, well, I mean, not not. I'm, I'm just saying like it, it should be part of when they make a show like the the contracts of everybody involved. Like not not be. we're not involved in it, obviously. Yeah. But if if a show gives you two seasons and they're going to leave it on a cliffhanger. One more episode. Things ought to get wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come on now. 100% agree. Anything. Um, the other side of that, when a show is expected to be done mm-hmm. and they do what is almost a perfect finale and then they find out they're getting picked up, uh-huh. what do you do? Especially when it's the, the, the show has changed so much in that finale. Mm-hmm. It's like, how are they going to do this now? Mm-hmm. So um, do you watch Elementary? at all no okay so you won't care if i say things nope okay so uh if if anyone's really like catching up on elementary oh god (laughs) uh they did something that could have been a nice way to end everything as their last season's finale okay and then they found out that they're getting picked up for another season so what happens is like the whole premise of the show is that Sherlock Holmes is in New York City mm-hmm. in modern times yeah, and finds Watson and they live together mm-hmm. and obviously there's no romance or anything. It's just that like and he's not tight. like he's kind of mentally not all there, right? He is, but he's a he's a recovering heroin addict. Oh, OK, OK. okay. So that's like an underlying thing kind of the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it goes away at times, but it comes back every now and then. OK. But it's it's actually like it's very believable for his character that he would need to drown out his over analysis yeah. here and there. And that's what he went to to do it. And now it's just a problem that's lingering all the time. Uh-huh. But the the way that the show ends is Joan is accused of a crime that they end up that Sherlock ends up taking the heat for instead of like he's he's. He's going um, like mano y mano with a serial killer for most of this last season. Okay. And the serial killer is very smart mm-hmm. and has has gotten himself in a situation where like Sherlock's taking the heat for this crime that Joan committed. Okay. And as such, he is going back home to England. And if he steps foot in the U.S. again, he's arrested. He's, he's arrested because okay. he, he took the heat for this crime. Yeah. Joan didn't commit the crime either, but she was framed for it. Okay. So they say their goodbyes. He goes off to London or uh-huh. England or whatever. And uh, she 
decides to go with him. Okay. So the final, we don't know that at first though. So the final shot we see is Baker street and we see him step out of his place. And then she steps out of her door on the duplex Mm -hmm. next to him. So they live side by side on Baker street. Mm hmm in london very much like in and the now the they're story. going back to it's not how the story began mm-hmm. but they're going back to our classic idea of sherlock holmes yeah and you're like wow that is that's kind of beautiful like yeah. it's they they had done this like transplanting of sherlock holmes and they brought it back to oh now is they're where they should be uh-huh. and it feels right yeah even though we know like can't go back to america <laughs> but yeah. like feels right also completely ignoring criminal extradition treaties but again that's just the yeah. legal brain ruining, sure, ruining sure. It for me sorry <laughs> sure no you're right you're right so it ends it on a very like nice note yeah and then they got picked up for another season oh so now what now what do you do you do just like a six episode like run of are they gonna be in england for the next season yeah and then like how do you end that better than what you just did that is that's a that's a tough hill to climb I mean, the only thing that they didn't do as much as I would have liked to do is bring back Moriarty for like the last season. That oh. would have been nice. Was I thought he was in the series. Though. There is there is a Moriarty in the series, but uh, hasn't been seen for a while. OK. And then and it's mainly because the person playing Moriarty, I believe, is way more prominent than they were before. Who Who was it? Uh, I don't know if I want to say in case people want to watch. I mean, it's been years, but it's like one of the best twists of the first season of elementary oh, okay maybe then don't say it yeah there could be people who don't want to catch up yeah i don't i don't necessarily because i it was what it was the thing that kind of got me invested in the show i was really? like that is really smart and really brilliant yeah they may then maybe we shouldn't say that yeah <laughs> <laughs> completely ruin it <laughs> right so yeah i don't know what they're gonna do now i mean i guess they could they could prove that he's innocent that she's innocent Mm -hmm. but then in doing that they also like in in the last episode they also like the police chief that they'd been working with Mm -hmm. they had a tremendous falling out with sherlock and him and like patching that up is difficult it's there's just it's a mess like it's not realistic to think that they could go back to new york it's not whatsoever yeah i mean at this point you would think that like the business aspect of the industry and the the creative aspects would somehow be able to reconcile because this has been a problem forever. Like because as, when they line up, doesn't business end up being better usually anyway because they've gotten fan loyalty your on end, their side? Yeah, your end product is that much better. Why not come together and have and build a solution mm-hmm. instead of just having these two sides of the same business working sort of, I mean, with one side working against the other, like, mm-hmm. you know, like you can definitely figure out ahead of time if like, you know, like you need another six episodes or not. Like from a start, like maybe that means putting more like creative people on the business mm-hmm. side. I don't know. Like, it just seems like they should have figured this. Like I know the ending episodes air way after they've, film them and going back to do more is expensive Mm -hmm. if like you've left something dangling but also make the call on whether something's getting canceled before because they take mid-season breaks for a reason yeah make the call like then like planning right yeah yeah i don't know that sucks i it sucks but i've also become sort of divested from like network tv yeah i know it's it's i mean it is hard because you know like a lot of it there's no appointment TV anymore. It's all just true. like DVR. It's true. Like when your DVR starts to fill up to a certain extent, you're just like, ah, this is overwhelming. Like, you know, I was fortunate enough to have to upgrade our, you know, our cable set up because the old DVR failed. Mm. That just kind of, there's this renewed sense of freedom <laughs> because I didn't have like, 19 episodes of a of a show that i haven't watched in ages yeah. just sitting on the dvr staring me in the face every time like i go to like the recorded shows yeah. and it's tough like there's so much out there now like i can definitely see myself just not watching tv and just sticking purely to like youtube like a streaming service and like like just anime that i would yeah. like yeah and so there has to be like a bigger draw to like 
to cable or, you know, network television, mm-hmm. you know, like I'll still go back and watch Hawaii Five-0, but that's just because it has a, a like a seed of something that I still sure. like hold dear, which is namely like the place where it's shot. Sure. You know, like I have feelings about that. But, you know, if it's just a show that has a semi enticing storyline, I'm not going to get around to it. Yeah, I hear which, you. Which sucks. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, next one is the Todd Phillips Joker movie. Mm, this is Joaquin Phoenix, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. I know we have to now clarify which Joker movie we're talking about because <laughs> yeah. we're at that point in which that's insane alone right there. Good, but also weird. Yeah. Um. So I kind of have the same beefs with this that I did with Solo. Mm-hmm. And I still haven't seen Solo and I still don't plan on watching Solo. Mm-hmm. And it's largely because guess who doesn't need an origin story? Mm. Even more so than Han Solo. Mm-hmm. The Joker. Yeah. A Joker origin movie is the stupidest thing. Yeah. I like I don't see a reason to care. Like he's just sort of this amorphous evil mm-hmm. that, you know, can go toe to toe with Batman. That's all I really need. Yeah. You give him an origin, you've already taken away from the character. Yeah. And I think, you know, the Dark Knight actually did a pretty good job of this where they sort of made his origins ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Every time Heath Ledger talked about, you want to know how I got this smile? Or you want to know how story. I got this face? It was like a different story. And so you never really knew, like, you know, where he came from. But it also sort of contributed to the mysticism surrounding the the Joker. Mm-hmm. Because you didn't know exactly how he got this way, but he is really screwed up. So yeah. maybe it doesn't matter. That's all you need to know. Yeah. And that's kind of the ethos of his this character is that he's so messed up. That you're so focused on what he's doing now that his past is kind of irrelevant. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I kind of I, I feel the same. And way. anything they give us would be disappointing. Now, I before and I say that or the Joker doesn't need an origin story. There's all the comic fans yelling out there. The killing joke, the killing <laughs> joke, <laughs> which is famously a Joker origin story and a story that I love. Yeah. So if I love that, why do I not love this? Mm-hmm. Well, in the killing joke. And this is one way the movie could remedy the whole existence of it Mm -hmm. but i don't see a movie doing unless they're all doing this and that's why they're doing multiple joker movies i don't know Mm -hmm. in the killing joke joker makes it a point to say that even he does not trust his memories Mm -hmm. and he literally says this is a quote from the killing joke sometimes i remember it one way sometimes another if i'm going to have a past i prefer it to be multiple choice Mm. Which is kind of the same idea yeah. that the Heath Ledger joke gives us. So he tells us this wonderful story, and then it's like, yeah. but that might not be it either. It could just all be made up. Right. So who knows? And if the movie does that, okay. Okay. I'm I'm with you a little bit. Yeah. I get it. I don't see a movie being like, here's a story that we spent millions of dollars on. Mm-hmm. It might not be. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. I just don't see them doing that. Yeah. I think part of the reason that I kind of had doubts about it is just that Joaquin Phoenix is such a serious actor Mm -hmm. that I don't see him. And I think he's notoriously a method actor as well, right? I believe so. Or at least he, he gets very deep into whatever role that he's playing. Sure. Right? So... It's just like it's somehow not believable that he would go deep enough into this role that it would be convincing or he would just somehow make it too heady and dramatic. We like, just had a method actor playing the Joker and it didn't go well. Yeah. And that was weird. <laughs> yeah. That was strange. It just it Again, was, I don't necessarily blame him, but the yeah. direction was not It was off putting. Like it was just something about it. Like there's too many tattoos. Like yeah. what the fuck was that? Yeah. And so I mean Joaquin Phoenix is a fantastic actor. Um I recently watched Oh my god, what is the name of that movie? Um the one where he's like the like he's like a contract killer that has to retrieve somebody's daughter or something like that. Oh. I forget what it's called. We were never here or something like that. I don't think I've seen it. Yeah, it was not it was not a major release, but I only saw it because a friend of mine had recommended it to me. Oh okay. then so like he was really great in that movie. Like I feel like he's really good in like these sort of stories where we have to familiarize ourselves with the story. Mm -hmm. The Joker story is so ingrained in pop culture at this point. Mm -hmm. We've already had multiple versions of the character, Mm -hmm. even with the whole, I don't remember exactly how this all started sort of concept. 
the Joaquin Phoenix, like I just seeing like the set pictures where like he's in the sort of the maroonish suit with sure. the weird clown makeup. Like it's not even like Joker makeup. It's like this weird sort of it's kind of generic clown, generic clown yeah. makeup. Yeah, it's like it feels washed out mm-hmm. almost. You know, like the Joker like is just notoriously like his colors just pop. You know, yeah. he's that like purple suit with the lime green, the accents, and like the white face with the red smile mm-hmm. and the you know the dark green or green the greenish hair. Like all of that pops. It's not washed out in any way. And so even just the visual aspect of it to me just seems unappealing. I actually, I really like the idea of a Joaquin Phoenix Joker. Mm -hmm. And I'm bummed that he's in this. Really? (laughs) Yeah. So what, in what world, like, what is the perfect version of a Joaquin Phoenix Joker? I even liked a little bit of the visual that they gave us, just not the face paint. Oh, okay. Like if they transplanted that. And and I don't think he has to have the long hair either. I feel like that's a carryover from Heath Ledger for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think he could get away with a more classic looking Joker. Yeah, I like the the quaffed look is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Like that sort of. I think he could do like a Nicholson. Yeah. Kind of Joker look. Now, do you think that the Joker? So we've already seen so many iterations of Batman. It's pretty clear that Batman doesn't need Joker to to have a does success, not no to have a successful movie. But does the Joker need? Batman or a hero to make it a successful movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because Joker is I'm making a lot of food references here. I don't know if it's (laughs) because I haven't eaten, but (laughs) Joker is like a sauce. Like he makes the movie complete Mm -hmm. alone. It's not great. I feel like there needs to be something that he is tied to Mm -hmm. that creates a more well-rounded dish as opposed to just having a gravy boat full of crazy. You know what I mean? Joker's purpose is to incite chaos yeah, and to break up the order of another character. If there's no other character with which to disrupt, the Joker becomes kind of pointless. Yeah. I, he even says it in the Dark Knight. He's like, if I ever caught my tail, I don't know what I would do with myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not super excited. Yeah. About conceptually, it. I'm just like, meh. This is probably not like, you know how much I love Batman yeah. <laughs> in the Batman <laughs> universe. I don't plan on seeing this either. Yeah. I, it's just, I don't know if it's like tone deaf executives just trying to build something by looking at disparate elements and thinking this goes with this. And so we can make a, a successful thing if we put those two together. Yeah. Because Joaquin Phoenix is notoriously a great actor. The Joker is notoriously a attractive storyline. What if we put them together? Like, it's just like this weird yeah. sort of like Lego building blocks combination of building a story. And like the fans are just kind of looking at it like, no, like that's not how you build it. Like, that's not what you do. Right. Like you need instructions for this. <laughs> they lost their manual. Like the manual. You need your manual for this. And by manual, we mean the comics. Yeah. The stuff we're already familiar with. Mm-hmm. Pull from that. Do what Marvel does. Build on it. Like interpret it in a way. Don't like do this weird thing where like, oh, maybe this guy can do a good job with this thing. And we're just going to put it together yeah. and make money. Like, Yeah. If there's no Batman in this movie, this movie, I don't know how story wise it could be that appealing. Yeah. There needs to be like some sort of backbone to it. Yep. Batbone. Ooh. I see what you did there. Ooh. <laughs> uh, my last freak out is Movie Pass, which, mm. which yeah. not too long ago was on the other side of this list. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot about this, a lot of news about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a bunch of news. Uh, so, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of feelings out there. A lot of feelings, a lot of feelings. Um, so, they've changed things quite a mm-hmm. bit. I, I guess we all should have known that when something seems too good to be true, it's because it's not financially viable. Yeah. Like, what was it? Of, like, whose idea was this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this probably isn't going to work. But you know what? I'm going to ride the train as long as it goes. Mm-hmm. And then when it crashes, I'll still have gotten my uh, financial need out of it. Like my my worth. You out will of have it. reaped the benefits of right. at least the short term. Right. But then they started messing with my time and I got angry. So. 
<laughs> <laughs> so like if i if, if if it just started crashing and burning and it was just gone it would have made me less angry than i am than what because they did. now it's interfering with my life right and i think i read about this at some point on yeah. Twitter or something so <laughs> yeah, i like ranted on twitter uh so there are now only limited movies that you are available to watch on any given day. Mm -hmm. And they document these movies on a certain part of their website. They show which ones are going to be available on that given day. Yep. Most of the time, this shows like 10 or 11 movies on it. Mm -hmm. Then you go on your app and it shows like two. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where's the, where's the, what? Like you which said one 11. Is, like which one is right? Right. Like I can only buy tickets for these two movies. Uh -huh. But you telling me that there are 11 different movies I can buy tickets for, but yeah. I only see two. Like, what's going on here? So that's problem number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're going to keep rolling. <laughs> uh, so I'm on an annual plan right now. Uh -huh. So, like, I have even less to be angry about because I'm paying, like, six ninety five a month, and uh -huh. I paid it up front. That's the thing that I am upset about is that paid I paid for it up front, and they're changing their service mm -hmm. without, like, I already paid. Yeah. So you can't just go and take things away from me that I, I already paid, paid for. for one thing. Yeah, you're giving me another. Yeah. Exactly. So the annual plans at the end of whenever you got the annual plan, whenever that is up for me, it's in December. Mm -hmm. They will convert to monthly plans because monthly plans will be the only thing available now. And they're changing the model. I have no problem with changing the model, but honor what I signed up for. Yeah. The model is going to change to nine ninety nine a month, which is what it originally was mm -hmm. for three movies a month. And you know what? I'd still be fine with that mm -hmm. if these other issues weren't also there. Like, yeah. I'm not going to the movies. I'm going maybe like twice a month, mm -hmm. sometimes three. Mm -hmm. So I'd still be fine with that. I'd still be getting my money's worth. Yeah. Uh, but there's more. There's more. <laughs> but wait, <laughs> there's more. So this was the biggest problem for me. Uh, and here's a general recommendation to movie pass users. If there are any out there still. <laughs> Don't bother checking the app in the morning because don't make plans around what you think is going to be available oh, because God. things change, apparently. So I was going to go see Mission Impossible Fallout uh -huh. for like a 12.30 p.m. Uh, this is the thing I read about. On the yeah, way. yeah. A 12.30 p.m. show on a Friday. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's at work. Uh -huh. This is during like this is like the week before school starts. Yeah. So most people at work or busy or something. Yeah. Not a super busy day whatsoever. Yeah. They had said that they would start maybe taking away some of the peak movie times. And this is not a peak movie. And time. this is definitely not a peak movie time. Mm -hmm. So I was like, so I'm going to, I made the choice. Like I was like, it would be more convenient to probably see it at night. That's probably not going to be available. You made an educated choice. Right. Based on their information. Right. So I said, I'm going to go to like a 1230 <laughs> afternoon show. Uh-huh. Which is safe. No way. So I checked the app in the morning at like 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. It's listed. Sweet. Let's do it. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. By the time I get to the theater, it's not available anymore. What? It's gone. It's not in the app anymore. They cut out like a bunch of show times. Wow. Gone. That sucks. So like I ended up paying. I use like fortunately I have a bunch of like regal points or whatever. So mm -hmm. I got a free movie ticket from that. Okay. So I didn't have to pay pay. Yeah. But. Still, still, I'm using that on something that I should be using the thing I pay for on. Yeah. Uh, so for some reason, the shows at 6.40 p.m. and 9.40 p.m. that same evening, a Friday night, mm -hmm. a high movie traffic night, yeah. remained available throughout the rest of the evening. Wow. So if and I had planned the rest of my day, like I planned stuff at night because uh -huh. I was going during the day during the day because i was trying to go by what they said would be the best option mm -hmm. and and meanwhile my peak showing because <laughs> the only reason they take them away is if they're peak that's what i was told rob's doing really aggressive air quotes I right am. now like they're really my aggressive. peak showing had seven people in the theater wow like what the hell it's like the fourth week this movie is out too okay that is probably an algorithm that has to be an algorithm because that sounds illogical as hell and also like doesn't make sense no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Like, <sighs> like as soon as like I have a reminder in my outlook right now, as soon as like December comes around, I'm canceling this so hard. <laughs> so hard. You are clicking cancel with authority. So hard. So hard. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I have a couple of like 
like I have a coworker who had movie pass and he was similarly frustrated with mm-hmm. how things turned out and just reading about people's experiences where much like yours, people make an educated guess based on, you know, the sort of conventional wisdom surrounding movie times. Sure. And they are inevitably disappointed because either the showing was removed or, you know, maybe it was actually pretty crowded for some reason, mm-hmm. you know, like the algorithm or whatever makes this decision shoved people into this sort of, they corralled them into this movie time. And so now instead of seeing a movie comfortably, you're forced to see it like literally packed to the brim. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. It just seemed like it was too good to be true in the beginning. Yeah. Because they were like, listen, buy this thing on a monthly, like a, like a, monthly or annual plan you see as many movies as you want do it go nuts and it just seems like like one movie every 24 hours man. but you can only see every movie once but it's still that was the original caveat and i was like that's fine if you could only see every movie once when you consider that there are at least one to two movies releasing every week yeah you were seeing at least one to two movies every week you could if you kept up yeah and so like just something about that was just in my brain i was just like what is George Soros or like the guy that runs Amazon, like Jeff Bezos? Yeah. Are they backing this company? Right. Because they must be hemorrhaging money, <laughs> just bleeding green because it doesn't make any sense. Well, apparently their biggest, the biggest way they plan to make money fell through. Oh, okay. Things like just putting ads in the app and. Mm-hmm like working with movie theaters and stuff like that. And then they just got turned down at every, every plan. So they had like a plan, but it didn't work out the way they wanted it to. Because they just got rejected by everybody. Wow. Cause like right away with the rate of signups they had, Mm -hmm. they're like, look at our, like, look at our user base. Look at this information. They were going to sell information as well. Yeah. That was the other thing. They were going to take like the data. And I don't know if people are like, we don't want it, but like for whatever reason they couldn't, sell the data i mean there's got to be some sort of privacy concern i mean i guess but it, they could just put that in their agreement that this data will be used for whatever yeah somehow. i'd be like fine i'm going for <laughs> <laughs> whatever i don't care if you track which movies i watch someone's doing that anyway yeah yeah just too good to be true i i, I go back and forth as to whether or not i would have bought it mm-hmm. if i'd like didn't have the obligations they have now with like family sure because i mean that's the primary thing that's keeping me out of a movie theater it's just that i cannot like even approach the steps oh, yeah, without, yeah, yeah. like i just have no time so like even if i did have the time would i have bought this pass part of me says yes because the promise of like even the promise that they have now where you know you can see three movies a month for like for 10 bucks for 10 bucks that's great yeah you're but already, not if they're gonna limit it to like two possible movies on any given day yeah the amount of money that I'm saving allows me to sort of forgive certain things. Sure. But the idea that there needs to be some sort of schedule freeze within a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just adjust the schedule on the fly like that within three hours. Yeah. Like that's too short. Like people plan, like some people will, you know, fly by night. They will just watch a movie whenever like they'll just go to the theater probably and look to see what's available on their app mm-hmm. and they'll just see that movie that's fine but some people like they make appointments like you to go and see a certain movie at a certain time yep you cannot adjust that is just not that is the opposite of a best practice that is the worst practice yeah like for customer loyalty like you just you are just slapping them in the face every single time they use the app like it doesn't make sense yeah and it's like that <sighs> You're already screwed on so many levels in terms of your funding. Like, why would you do that to the people who are giving you the lifeline that you need to keep going? Right. If you're having that much problem with everything, at, at least, least make your treat customers your, happy. Yeah. Their customer support is crap, too. From oh, whatever. really? Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. All terrible. It's all terrible. All terrible. Uh, we had reviews and news we were going to do, too, but we're almost to two hours. Woo! <laughs> so I think we're going to shelve some of that stuff for now. Yeah. And uh, we're going to wrap things up. All right. <laughs> so before we get out of here, any uh, final thoughts or something you want to plug, Mr. Paul O? Um, I don't have anything to plug myself, but, you know, if you feel so inclined, please go to thegeekgeneration.com and support the Patreon for Random Movie Club. 
it is it's a quality show it, it gives you and it's re- not just for random movie club that's like the incentive of it yeah but it's supporting everything it's supporting, it's supporting this YouTube. show it's supporting the twitch streams it's supporting the youtube content everything and i mean if you partake in any part of the geek generations vast library of material <laughs> You know, for the first however many years, it was completely free. Think about turning around, turning it around and putting a little bit of investment into the company. We could be glorious. Like, like even small amounts, you know, per month can contribute to quality of life adjustments for the podcast. Yeah. You know, like getting a second one of these microphones. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Rob is pointing to his microphone, which is a beast. And it, I mean, you know, it picks up. Everything in I have glorious a, sound. I quality. have like a $65, 70 microphone. You have a $25 microphone. Yeah. But if everyone could have the same microphones, hey. Imagine you could hear the sound of me breathing in <laughs> ASMR. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's just like, you know, if you feel so inclined, you know, support the podcast, support the Geek Generation by going to the Patreon and kicking in a couple bucks a month. Like, like I said before, like stop supporting that IG model that your wife doesn't know about and just put that money towards the geek generation because <laughs> this is a much more wholesome thing to fund. Let's just put it that way. Sure. And eventually we'll get Volpe nudes. Yeah. Who knows? Eventually. He no doesn't promises. know yet. Yeah. No promises. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> All right. For everything else we do, head on over to thegeekgeneration.com. If you use iTunes, please rate the show and write review. I suppose I should say Apple Podcasts now. Oh, yeah. Right? It's all different now. If you use Apple Podcasts, please rate the show and write a review, but you probably have to write those on iTunes, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> watch our live podcasts, cooking, gaming, and more at twitch.tv slash thegeekgeneration. You can send emails to podcast at thegeekgeneration.com. And as always, the show theme is provided by Machine Supremacy. A link to their site can also be found on our site. If you haven't already, go hit the sub button on Random Movie Club because it is out there. And we will be back soon with more geeky stuff for you. And we will see you then. Later. Bye. Make it so.